Wells based in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I have the pleasure of talking with one of my all time sought out guests for this show, Alex Kerr. Thank you so much for joining. Hi, Joy. <laughs> Delighted to be here at last. <laughs> this is great. Um, I, when I first started the show, I think you were on my top list and I, I couldn't connect somehow and it just worked out perfectly now that we're both going to be at this Minka summit, uh, coming up in Kyoto in April and you're the keynote speaker and you were the only speaker that I haven't talked to in the series. <laughs> so I thought I have to try, I have to try to talk to you. I'm so excited to talk about remodeling old houses. Uh, you are Japan's expert and longest running success story of remodeling traditional houses in a way that is so sustainable. So I'm so excited to talk to you. Thanks so much. Well, it's good to talk to you. And I'm glad you brought up this Kaminka Summit uh, because I think it's going to be extraordinary. I think it might be a bit of a turning point uh, yeah. in this story. So I think so. Apparently they have... Uh, sold a bunch of tickets the first night, uh, the dinner on the first night is mm -hmm. sold out. Yeah. Um, but there's still a lot of things that people can can go to. There's like workshops and carpenters mm -hmm. walking through old Minka and some Minka for sale. It's going to be really great. Yeah. So you can uh, buy a Minka while you're waiting for my talk. <laughs> right. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Now, I, I was listening to some of your talks, reviewing again today, and I love this idea that you use about mitate. Yes. And I think yeah. mitate has so many great connections to reusing old houses. Can you give us a bit of an idea? What is mitate? Where does it come from? Uh, well, I think it began in tea ceremony, or at least it has a tea ceremony use, and it means taking something and using it in a completely different way. So they would take a Korean rice bowl and use it as a tea bowl, or they would use a roof tile and use it as a plate, something like that. Uh, and so that, that was the origin of it. And then in, uh, for example, in Japanese painting or prints, they would do, they would say, they would say it's a mitate of kabuki actors as waterfalls or something like that. I mean, they could be quite weird. Um, but my concept of mitate is that, you know, these houses that we're restoring were farmhouses mostly, um, except of course in Kyoto, they were shop houses, machia. But either way, you know, they were for uh, craftsmen uh, or uh, wholesalers, people like that in the cities, or they were for farmers. Well, what we're doing is for travelers, restaurants, boutiques, uh, you know, uh, uh, contemporary artist studios, all kinds of other uses. So that's why I call it mitate. And it's not just the houses uh, that there's a mitate going on, but the countryside itself. Japan's countryside, sadly, doesn't function anymore. It's in deep trouble. People are aging, the villages are emptying. And so what do you do? Well, you're going to have to revive it with a new, completely new content, in a sense. The village is still there, but something new will be going on. And so that's, mitate has a, has a pretty broad uh, significance. Clo uh, food, too. Yeah. You're taking local you, ingredients, yeah, uh, certain kinds of fish or vegetables that it would, would have been used in traditional cooking, and then you're coming up with something brand new to do with it. You, you talk about those three parts, the uh, mitate in terms of remodeling old houses uh, mm -hmm. and food culture and bringing new ways to enjoy food in a way that's appealing for visitors, maybe, and yes. arts and crafts. And you talk about the Ia Valley, where we will talk about a lot today, because that's mm -hmm. your, your first love and the magical place that you found in Japan. And then uh, you have other projects around Japan that you've helped get started, which have brought uh, young people back to live there, uh, educate, to train and learn new skills, and to want to stay there. Um, so there's that social support aspect of sustainability, which is so big yeah. in all yeah. of your projects, right? Absolutely. I, I always say that what I'm trying to do 
yes, we're doing houses, but it's the houses are a means to something a bit broader. And it's really the re revitalization of the countryside that we're aiming for. Um, I, I, let's talk about the design of the houses. <laughs> so when you first found Chiodi uh, mm -hmm. in the Ia Valley, you were a student in Tokyo and you That's were just right. traveling. Is that right? That's right. I was hitchhiking around the country. In fact, this is even before I was a student in Tokyo. This was 1971. <laughs> uh, and I had, of course, been in Japan as a boy, but now I was in college and I was thinking, is this really the country I want to devote my life to? And so I spent that summer hitchhiking around. And just as fate, there was a big arrow of, I was so skinny in those days. Uh, I hate to see that photo. Um, uh, there was a big arrow of fate that led me to Ia. And at the end of that trip, somebody that I'd met along the way took me, it looked like this photo actually, took me into Ia Valley and I fell in love. And then later, when I came back uh, a year later as an exchange student in Tokyo, I spent all my time down in Ia and eventually found Chiori. Oh, amazing. And you you often say there is no houses anywhere around Japan that are quite like these houses, the thatched roofs. Um, it's really unusual to find these types of houses now in Japan. And they have a very long history um, in that Ia Valley area. You say back to the Jomon period. Is that right? Well, thatched houses are everywhere in Japan. But thatched houses like this are not. And the reason was it, that the, ever, ever since St. Francis Xavier, or whoever it was, brought tobacco from the New World, Ia was the tobacco producing region. Something about that misty air. I don't know what it was good for tobacco. But they used to dry it inside the houses over the Irori hearth. And so the, the tobacco was hanging. When I got there, there were still people that lived that way. This is. Uh, what Chiori looked like when I first found it. And th those bits of rice straw rope that you see over your head are where they hung bamboo railings uh, from which they hung the tobacco. And so that meant, and this is where it, it, what makes it different, they never put in ceilings. They're wide open cathedral-like spaces, high, uh, you know, towering interiors. So even though you get much bigger houses, for example, in Shirakawa, where they're, you know, three and four stories, but because each story has a ceiling in it, you never get that enormity, that huge sense of space. And so that's really different. Plus, the other thing is they went on using the Irori, those floor hearths. And if you're using Irori, you don't do tatami, right? Because one spark and you'd go up in flames they kept the old wooden floors. So these shiny wooden floors and the irori, and, the, and that created, of course, the smoke from the irori darkened everything, turned the whole thing black inside. That mysterious mood of Ia, it, you just don't find anywhere else. And it's a very special view from all the oh, houses well. that you've remodeled there. Um, it's looking up. I think I have a picture. It's like a hamlet. It must be very difficult to get there. But once you're inside the house looking out, what an amazing view at any of these places, right? Well, I mean, that's what I fell in love with Ia for and to begin with was not actually the houses. It was this landscape. And it really is uh, more almost like a legendary Chinese landscape or a Japanese ink painting or something. It doesn't look like Japan, normal Japan, because the mountains are so steep. And people, this is what's, uh, there you are. This you won't see anywhere else because people live on the mountainside, which they don't. In Japan, people live in the valleys or on the plains. And the mountains are basically green, and that might be where you'd find a temple or a shrine, right? Gods live on the mountains, but not people. And so Ia is unique in that respect, because there, there are no plains. There is nowhere to live in the valley. It's sort of a Grand Canyon down there. And so people had to live up on the high slopes. 
and uh, you said you would walk up into the hamlets with your dog uh, when you were exploring. Yes. There were no roads up there years ago, right? No, well, when I found Shuri, there was no road. It was an hour's walk up the hillside. There was one road that went along the river, uh, but otherwise you walked. Now, you spent a lot of time there before you decided to buy a house and spend time remodeling. This is something uh, people who move from the city out to the countryside always say is before you buy something, you need to spend time there, make sure that is the community that you want to, to live in, right? Did you find that before you, all of your projects, like to get to know the area before you decide to do a project there? Well, that's a, a part of it. Um, but, he, you know, here's something I would say. I'd say almost any place in Jap Japan's countryside, if you can find a house and if it's relatively unspoiled, the people are going to be lovely and you will enjoy it. I'm not so worried about am I going to like this village because I always like the village. And it just so happened that in Ia, because it was so remote and they had never seen any, I mean, not only foreigners, but Japanese from outside didn't come in. And so, in a sense, they had no resistance. <laughs> People were just wide open uh, to the, to the, it, to somebody coming in. Uh, you said there was a word that was used for foreigners from outside Japan, as well as for people from Tokyo. It was the same word, right? Well, yeah, because they, they used to uh, think of themselves, because they live up on these hillsides, as kami, meaning above, and everybody else is shimo, shimo no shito, down below people from below. And so whether it was me from the States or whether it was some Japanese from Tokyo, they were all shimonoshito. Oh, that's so interesting, isn't it? Um, and, okay, let's, yeah. let's talk a little bit about how you rebuilt it because I think your perspective on rebuilding these houses to be used not to be museum pieces, just to be looked at and people take photos and go away. Your whole process, your whole aim was to make something people want to be comfortable and enjoy being in, right? So you really went to some pains to keep the historical aesthetic, but to make it comfortable. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. And, and, you know, in Japan, people say, where did you come up with this strange and unusual idea? But of course, it's not. It's Europe and certain parts of America have been doing this for 100 years. So you can go to Tuscany or Provence or Santa Fe or whatever and find these old houses or, or Shenandoah, you know, all over that have been fixed up and made comfortable. Japan didn't do that. There was this dichotomy and people had the idea that either you kept the old house and you went back to the Edo period and lived in total misery and the dark and the dirt and the horrible toilet and all that, or you tore it down and you were modern, right? There was no middle ground. And what I said is, wait a minute, it's been done all over Europe and in other play in Bali in lots of places. Why can't Japan do this? And so that's what we tried to do. And we got we tried to get away from this idea that restoration means showpiece and uh with lots of rules and regulations and you can never so much as change as one plug you know no it's mitate yes the old house is wonderful and we want to preserve what's great about it but we're pulling it into the modern age and so i'm not trying to show as restoration often tries to do in japan this is how it was in meiji this is how it was in Edo. I wanted to make it uh, now, the house of now. We use techniques and materials that are traditional because they're part of what's valuable about the region and have an ecological importance too, uh, but we're not going back in time. Um, I love how you use, you do use a lot of traditional artisans, uh, like to use the thatch roofer. Uh, you mm -hmm. needed a special skilled technician oh, yeah. to do that, right? Um, mm -hmm. Was it hard to find some people to do it in the traditional styles? It's getting harder. Uh, th there used to be a thatcher right there in Ia. Uh, now uh, our thatcher comes from Gifu, uh, but, but they do exist. And there is a demand for thatched houses all over Japan. Thatching is hugely decreased from what it used to be 
but there are still thousands of these houses. And so, uh, so it does continue. And of course, the more you restore and the more you thatch, the easier it is to carry this tradition on. Yeah. So beautiful. I'm also trying to support uh, thatchers in other areas. There's a wonderful guy in Arima, just north of Kobe, where it turns out there are hundreds of thatched houses up there. Wow, great. And, and he's doing some really unique work. Uh, so, so this is something that, that all over Japan uh, I try to keep up with because I'm a kind of thatch fanatic. <laughs> well, it's interesting when you were talking about first thatching your roof, you were reusing old thatch? Well, yeah, we were too poor to actually cut any fresh thatch. So we got thatch from an old house that was being torn down that was full of soot. And so, you know, we looked like coal miners or something. There it is, yes. And, and that only lasted, though, because it was old thatch and half rotten already. Uh, that only lasted five or six years, and then we had to properly rethatch the whole thing. How often do you have to rethatch? I saw a house that a community had done a fundraiser to rethatch, and then they said they have to do it every five years. It really oh, no. costs a you not every five oh, years. No, Good. no, no, no. Well, it depends on how you maintain the house. And in the old days, when they were, of course, burning those the floor hearth, and it was being smoked every day, and the smoke dries it out, and also, uh, you know, drives out the, uh, the snakes and insects and so on. My house had not been thatched in something like 60 years. Now, the roof was leaking, but it was still there. Uh, a properly maintained house will go at least 20, if you're lucky, up to 40 years. Which, ironically, is about the same time span as those tin roofs that you see everywhere that are supposedly more durable. Hello, have I lost you? Hello. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Are you I okay? I think I lost yeah. you. I don't know how far I got. No, I, you were saying the thatch roof lasts as long as the tin roof. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, but they have to be properly maintained. Now, the other side of the story, go away, lock it up. Don't air it out. Don't ever burn the hearth. Uh, let it just kind of sit there and, and rot, then yes, five years is it'll it'll grow over with moss and start and and it won't last. But if if you look after these houses and air them out, uh, the thatch is incredibly hardy. For one thing, it's really thick. It's yeah. practically a meter thick. I mean, this is a, a serious roof. <laughs> Ton, tons of roof up there. There was a, a great talk that I had uh, with some people uh, just outside Kyoto, and they're trying to do thatched houses in, in that area. And they're yeah. bringing in people who know how to do it and teaching the young people yeah. how to do it and talking about how in the olden days, it used to be the whole community that would come together and help thatch this house. And then a right. month later, a yeah. different house or something. Yeah. It's awesome. That's what you're describing sounds a little bit like Miyama which is a town that has really dedicated itself to thatch uh, uh, north of Kyoto and has made quite a success of it because uh, one of the things about a uh, thatch that's a little bit uh, uh, non-intuitive is that it, it seems like it's old fashioned and expensive and wasteful and non-economic, but it actually has huge value, not only for tourists, but for artists that want to open studios and so on. And so Miyama has been an economic success, which is something that's a little bit surprising, I think, to a lot of Japanese who think by definition, something like thatch is, is just a kind of, you know, fun for esthetes or something. Uh, whereas actually in the, in the modern world, it takes on a completely different meaning. Yeah, that's so, it's so important for sustainability. Um, you have to have profits, you have to have income to support what you're doing. Um, you talk about getting a lot of, there is a lot of government funding to help mm -hmm. you do a lot of the projects, um, yes. but you do also employ people to come and run the, the business. So they, young people come into the town. This is all part of the revitalization of these rural communities to stop them yeah. from becoming ghost towns, right? 
Well, it's a new industry. Basically, forestry is in collapse. Uh, agriculture is in big trouble. Fishing is as well. So what's left? Well, sustainable tourism, not big bus tourism, which is so damaging, but the kind of tourism such as we have in IA, where people spend the night, eat the local food, you know, take their time. Uh, they spend more than they would on the big bus. But basically, uh, we, did a, we did a little study uh, of one of these big bus towns, and basically they spend about 35 minutes and they maybe use the, uh, the drink dispenser and buy a Coke and they might use the toilet and, that, and they take one Instagram and they go out. In IA, they, they spend the money uh, to stay at one of our houses. We cater the food, they might use the local taxi and whatever. And so we figured out that one of our guests is the equivalent of about 25 to 30, basically one busload in the big bus village and it doesn't create a problem for the village life uh, because we get in ia we get about three thousand guests a year and divide by you know the number of days in a year that's let's just average it out say 10 people a day well that's extremely manageable yeah. and and is not going to uh, turn village life on its head whereas you go to one of these big bus towns and you've got thousands of people uh, coming through every day. I mean, the village life is finished. Yeah. So it's and and yet the amount of money that they're spending in IA is the equivalent, if not more. And yeah. so there's a way to do it sustainably. And the and the other key thing, and this is something I think about a lot, is it's not just about the money. It's about uh, creating a community, a community of people who love IA and understand IA, and have some concern for it. And, the, and those are the people who have spent the night, maybe several nights, done some hiking, maybe visited one of our local people that were there making sopa or something. And that community is precious. And, and again, you don't find that in the big bus towns. And so uh, this is the kind of thing, uh, this is what I think of as sustainable tourism. Definitely, definitely. Um, if the money doesn't stay with locals and they only have the inconvenience of tourism, there is no sustainable tourism there, right? Uh, you exactly. have a great example about the bus trippers uh, spending about 630 yen. Um, people who stay at the Ia Valley uh, cottages, you fixed up nine of them, 90% occupancy before COVID. Yeah. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And most, I think of the biggest surprise for me and probably you as well, is most people who were booking were Japanese. Yes, uh, that was actually unexpected because when I started, uh, I thought it was going to be for foreigners and the foreigners come. Uh, but it turns out there's a huge demand among the Japanese. And remember, people that have grown up in Tokyo, I mean, we've had kids come and stay in our houses and They've not only old houses, they've never been on a futon before. They're foreigners, which means also with the good side of that is they don't have the allergic reaction that their parents often had. Because for an older generation in Japan, old Japanese life was something they just couldn't wait to get away from. It was uncivilized and it was also misery making because they remembered the days when these houses really were miserable. Yeah. Their kids have never had that, and so they come out it fresh. They see the beauty with uh, fresh eyes, and because the houses are comfortable, they enjoy it. And so mo there are a lot of modern J Japanese who are dying to go to faraway places and stay in an old house. They just didn't want to suffer. Yeah. I stayed in one place in Hiroshima, in a rural area called Akitakeda, and they mm -hmm. have some young entrepreneurs who are taking mm -hmm. these old houses, remodeling them with the beautiful aesthetic, but making it comfortable. You mm -hmm. do have to light the fire to make the bath, yes. but it's a modern, beautiful, comfortable bath inside. Yeah. So you have that interesting, a little bit hard work, but it has big payoffs. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah, so there, there is a generation of Japanese who love it. And, uh, and that's been shown all over Japan. So these projects, uh, of course, I've done a number of them, but there are other people doing them as well. And they're 
all over the country now. And they they get a, a regular stream of people. By the way, another great change, sea change, has, you know, 20 years ago, if you did this, nobody would ever know about you. Because if they didn't sign on to JTB or something, there was no access, right? But now, all you need is one internet page, one website, and people find out very fast. Uh, not to mention the Instagram and the rest of it. And so uh, uh, th there's a way to access the clientele that there wasn't before, which means that you can be anywhere. You can be on a mountaintop and you can be on an island and people will come. That's amazing. Uh, we have some great comments here. Dave O says, hooray for young Japanese <laughs> entrepreneurs. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> I'll second and that. And Antonias uh, says, how do these dwellings differ from the Ainu houses in the north? I recollect uh, similar hangings of tobacco and the same dark burnt colored interior. Interesting. Well, that's very interesting. And I have to admit that I don't know anything about Ainu houses in the North. And uh, except just one kind of guess based on my one visit to Ainu villages in 1971, <laughs> which is, is that about exactly 50 years ago? Oh, something like that. Anyway, is that they were rather small. And so you probably did have the same effect of the darkness and the, and the, the smoke. Uh, whereas in E, of course, you have this cathedral-like sense with these very, very high ceilings. But I could be imagining that. It, it's a 50-year-old memory. Yeah, I love that about remodeling old houses, that you can keep the bigger inside space. A lot of the more modern houses have much smaller oh. rooms. Yes. Yeah, that's what well, I love. Well, you know, there are a lot of myths about Japanese old architecture. And one of them is that the Japanese have always lived in tiny spaces. And that is so not true. Uh, these farmhouses are, are of considerable size. And even a lot of the townhouses in the cities uh, so it's really a post-war modern phenomenon. In fact, while I'm on myths, uh, my favorite myth of all is this idea, the, the, the very popular among contemporary architects, and a lot of Japanese have bought into this, that we Japanese have always, it, it's been scrap and build. We build houses and we, we uh, temples, and we tear them down. And, and, that, and look at Issei Shrine, right? Well, the fact is, find me one other shrine in Japan that does what Issei Shrine does doesn't exist. It's mm. the only one, which is to say that it's an enormous exception. And the reality was that if, unless it, there was a fire or an earthquake, the houses went on forever. And that's why Japan has the oldest wooden buildings in the world in Horyuji. That's why this country is littered with hundreds, actually tens of thousands of Meiji and Edo period houses. They've gone right on. People didn't scrap and build. They didn't tear them down. They valued them and they lived in them. And so that is an enormous misunderstanding. But but, but it has a grain of truth, which is, again, post-war. So after World War and build, and houses are built to last for 20 years, and the story's over. But that was never true of traditional architecture. That's really important to remember, isn't it? Uh, we have another question from Dave in Osaka. Thanks for joining. Uh, what's the cost of thatching a roof? Good question. About Whoa, a million? I don't know if yeah. I can count that high. <laughs> it's way more than a million. Uh, wow. but, but again, it depends a lot on how this is done and whether you can do some of it yourself and where you're cutting the thatch and all of that. But we're looking at a minimum of five million and it could be more. Wow. Um, let's talk a little bit about the local people around your area, because I mm. love I love going to Kamikatsu, not far mm. from where the Ia Valley is. I haven't been yes. to the Ia Valley yet. I have to mm -hmm. go. Um, yeah. They have a bancha there. Uh, do you have bancha in Ia Absolutely. Valley as well? well? Well, this photo is bancha. And uh, our Ia bancha, I think, is the queen of all the bancha. Uh, there's a thing called Awa Bancha. Awa is the old name for Tokushima Prefecture. And of course, they have it in Kamikatsu. But Iya's got a higher altitude, and it's a little bit cooler, and it's mistier. 
And so the effect of that somehow, oh, and, and the other thing is that the Ia Bancha is more primitive. Everything in Ia is more primitive. And so that kind of rustic, primitive taste, which is something really, it's sort of like you imagine uh, the original tea would have tasted like before they started really refining it for tea ceremony. Uh, that's the taste of Ia tea, the, the Ia I love Bancha. It. Mm. And it's fermented, right? So it's it has that healthy gut bacteria quality as well, right? Well, no, they don't even ferment it. No? They just oh. graze it in a big iron pot and then set it out to dry and that's that. It's almost untreated. If you're oh. really, uh, but, but it's not green tea, right? It's been uh, sort of braised once, but that's it. It's really mm. basic. And you have a really beautiful hard tofu in this <laughs> picture here. I want to try that as a vegan vegetarian. That is one of the hurdles for traveling in Japan. I'm yes. glad to know you have great tofu. I want to come. Oh, it's it's amazing. It's so thick. It's like cheese, really. And in fact, one of the mitate that I do uh, in Ia is a kind of tofu caprese, because we slice this tofu and then we put uh, uh, tomato slices and some basil and olive oil, and it is splendid. Uh, but you really can't pull it off with normal tofu that's too kind of gooey and falls apart. You need this cheese-like consistency. And it so, looks uh, amazing. Look at that. Yeah. Carried carried with a rope instead yes. <laughs> of no plastic to be seen. I no. love it. Uh -uh. I love to see the rope. Natural carrier of tofu. I've never seen that before. When I come back from the ER, I always bring back blocks of it. Do they let you bring it back to Thailand? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh not to Thailand. <laughs> I meant back to Kyoto. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Um, so let's let's uh, talk about the style that you're using, because we talked a little bit about um, keeping the original floorboards. Really interesting. I did not realize that floor, hardwood floor, predates tatami in oh, Japan. Yeah. Yeah, people I, think that Japan yeah. is the land of tatami, uh, which, which it is now, but it was not until really the Edo period. And originally, everybody lived on wooden floors. And that's pretty much gone, except some Zen temples in Kyoto, which where you see an intermediate stage where it's all wood, but there's a kind of a U-shaped surrounding area just of tatami. Ia was, a, was an air pocket because it was cut off really from the rest of Japan. It was like a little independent Tibet up there. And they never switched to tatami and they went on burning the floor hearts. And so you're seeing here a, an ancient Japan that's really gone in the rest of the country. Is so beautiful. And you said to keep the floorboard aesthetic, but all the floorboards were taken carefully taken off. And then underneath you put modern plumbing, heated floors, uh, Wi-Fi circuitry, electric uh, cables, oh, that kind of stuff. Everything. everything. Insulation. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, in fact, in the old days, under through those floors, you, you could actually feel the wind blowing up through the fl floors <laughs> until we finally got around to fixing it. Uh, but um, if in many of the houses, the floorboards were in not good enough condition. And so we, we still did wooden floors, but, but uh, with new wood. Whereas in, in my house, the floorboards were still there in a great shape. And so we were able to use them. Gorgeous. But we have what, whatever we've done, we've not tatamified it. You know, we've kept it as wood, as it always would have been. Yeah, beautiful. Um, now, I heard one of your talks talking about uh, the aesthetic, the broken view of the outside through beams. Yes. And I thought that was so interesting. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, the thing that I fell in love with in Japanese houses when I was a boy, a 12-year-old boy in Yokohama, and we would visit uh, houses of friend, Japanese friends, was uh, the, the uh, you know, there's that word ma in Japanese, meaning a space. The play of these ma, because they're basically uh, um, 
wide open structures without walls. They're basically just columns and sliding doors, sliding windows. And so the play of those spaces, you can open a door and see something farther in, open another door and something beyond that, or close it. Uh, the columns create their own kind of regular march of spaces. And that's incredibly satisfying. It's really the magic of Japanese architecture. And that's something that, that, we, that I always try to, not just to preserve, but to kind of bring out or, or to play with. Because again, we're not trying to restore the house exactly as it had always been. Uh, we're trying to do something new. And, and that's, by the way, a puzzle so the, the kind of, you could say the warp and weft, the vertical part of it is we're trying to preserve what was valuable, whether it was the materials or the ma, and then the weft would be, we're trying to make it fun and chic and, and comfortable and all those other things that are new. And so reaching that balance is always uh, sensitive, uh, like, such as these sunken floor living rooms that we've done. Uh, which were our challenge, how to do it and, and for it to work out right. Yeah, you you said it's so popular, people only spend all their time there yes. and don't use the rest of the house. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you also did a renovation of a restaurant where you have this long yes. table and have totally changed the way that this this building was used in such a perfect way for a restaurant and it has become a gathering place for locals i love it yes people like to have uh, wedding uh, events and things like that the thing about this long table which is a seven meter long piece of wood that had to be brought in with cranes and things is that it's a sunken uh, kotatsu like seating under it so you can you can actually sit comfortably with your legs down but the space, the ma of that space is exactly what that room had always been. So we preserved the room in its original shape, but we did something very new with it. Yeah, beautiful. I love the origotatsu, is it, where you put your legs under? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very comfortable. Wonderful. Well, you know, one of the things, again, it's uh, people say, well, what do you do to please the foreigners? And what should you do to attract the Japanese? And my feeling about that is that there's what I call modern people, which is Japanese and the foreigners, uh, are who we're, we're reaching out to. And that's pretty universal. We've had not had to do much of anything that is special for the Japanese or something. For example, most of our houses, whether they, there's some houses started out with, that aren't in Ia, but in other towns, started out with tatami and they still have tatami. Whether it's tatami or wood, people don't sit on the floor so much anymore. Japanese don't. So every house will have tables and chairs somewhere. And that's not just for the foreigners, that's for the Japanese as well. They need that. And a lot of our newer houses have beds somewhere because again, a lot of people want to sleep in a bed. And so uh, we, we do that. And, and that's really a, a kind of a, a matter of modern lifestyle, wherever people are coming from. People always rave about uh, Japanese toilets recently. And I, that's as someone who's lived in Japan for many years, <laughs> that's always a surprise. Are you sure you're talking about Japanese toilets? But what they mean yeah, what is they modern, mean sci -fi, yeah. modern Japanese oh, toilets. Oh, those yeah. toilets that practically <laughs> sing to you as you sit on them. Uh, yeah, which, which I think uh, my theory about those fancy modern toilets is that they're a reaction to the horror that came before. And so Japan had such ghastly, nasty toilets. They finally modernized them. They went to the other extreme and made the toilets into a culture of their own, you know. They really are something now. But, um, you know, like you'll see a public restroom and they'll have a couple Japanese toilets and Western toilets. You don't see many Japanese people or anybody no. using the Japanese style no. anymore, right? No. For years, the Shinkansen always had, had, had both, right? Yeah. And I say, why are they doing it? You can see, you can see people standing in the aisle waiting for the West. You'll never see anyone going to the Japanese. And finally they caught on and realized that. 
So all of your houses that you remodel, they all have beautiful Japanese uh, Western, Western, Western style, style toilets. Yeah. <laughs> Fancy Japanese technology, but Western style toilets. Uh, yeah. I think there's zero interest among our clientele anyway in, in a classic squat toilet, you know. Now, since you're doing a lot of these remodel projects quite far away from the towns, is it a difficult thing to have a modern toilet or to have, uh, do any of them have renewable energy? You talked about uh, modern windows, which are better insulated using insulation. Yes. Um, is plumbing an issue in these old houses? Well, I mean, a lot of the houses we've had to install cesspools and things. Uh, uh, plumbing is an issue. Uh, sadly, most of my houses are not very eco. Uh, and it's partly because a lot of them have been done as government projects. And, the, and we begged for it, but the funds weren't there. What we have tried to do at least is through good insulation to keep the heating expenses and things down. In particular, one of, every house that we do, if at all possible, has double paid glass. And Japan now has, again, it's a technological thing, but they're now able to make beautiful double pane glass, big sliding doors and things using wood frames. And, uh, and they're beautiful and, and, and they are incredibly efficient at keeping uh, the heat in or the, or the cool in. Uh, another thing, of course, is that there's proper insulation in the walls and under the floors and in the ceilings and so on. And some of the houses, like recently the ones we've done in Nagano, uh, have wood burning stoves. Yeah, I saw that. Those are very efficient yes. at heating. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Uh, we have a comment from Yuko Nakao. Thanks for joining from Facebook. She said, always loved your work, Alex, big fan. How much do you plan in advance when renovating, when you fiddle with electrical work, plumbing, modernization, restoration of traditional features? Do you absolutely plan it from the beginning or are you planning along the way, changing things? That's an interesting question. In the old days, it was step by step. We did one thing and then we did another. Ia was that way. Chiori, slowly, slowly, we would do one thing, do another. My house in Kameoka, uh, Tenmangu, is still that way. Uh, you know, we did the bedroom, then we did the kitchen, then we did the toilet, then we had to tear down that toilet, build a new toilet. You know, these uh, more large scale projects have been done in one, uh, basically one big, uh, what would I call it? It's sort of one adventure that's all in, in one go. And in that case, we, we do a lot of planning and, and a lot of uh, charts and graphs and things go up and down. And I'll say, you know, for example, I'll say, let's, we're going to have this wall of glass here. Won't that be beautiful? And then the architect comes back and says, but no, for earthquake purposes, you're going to have to have this part of the wall actually be solid. And, and there are all these other issues, uh, the, the, uh, even issues such as where you put the staircase, it can't be too steep or people will bump their heads or it will be unsafe. Uh, privacy issues, by the way, one of the biggest uh, kind of, I won't call it a problem, but it's something we have to keep in mind is that travelers nowadays don't want to just have open rooms that anybody else can walk through. They want their room to be uh, separate, even lockable and, and that creates quite a design uh, question. Mm. And so there are those kinds of issues. And, and they do have to eventually all get decided as one design. And then right. we're off and running. Now, that said, we've often had situations where, because what often happens with these houses is we strip them down. You, you pull out all the old ceilings and the plywood walls, you lift up the floors and you might have to redo the roof. And then what do you find? Oops, this whole side of the house is rotten. <laughs> you know, uh, and then, then you have to go a little bit back to the drawing board and there's certain things you find you couldn't do. Yeah. Now, one thing I, I didn't know, which I learned today is you say sliding doors were invented in Japan. The sliding door is a, a feature of Japanese houses not found anywhere else. I didn't realize. That is my belief. And I've never read a specialist article on this, but I did my own research on it. And I 
can't, I mean, Greece and Rome, no. Ancient China, no. Thailand, no. Uh, I don't know where anybody had sliding doors. And it was due to a kind of a perfect storm of, of things that happened to Japan. And, and one was that it was all wood architecture. And those houses were very dark. They needed light. And they and unlike Thailand, where you could where the where you could where the wind could blow through it, you actually did have a winter, and you needed to shut out the elements. And so they needed a way to have doors, but they worked with wood, you know, with stone architecture or brick architecture. It's not going to happen. Uh, but with all wood, it could. But it took centuries. I've written about all this in one of my books called Another Kyoto. There's a whole chapter on the centuries that it took to come up with sliding doors. It didn't happen overnight. Once they got it, then they ma they mastered it and uh, and it's become the default mode. But it really is Japan's, one of Japan's engineering achievements. Yeah, and it's, it's such, it's one of my favorite things about uh, when people restore old houses or re renovate old houses so beautifully. Um, I love these kind of shoji doors that can show you a uh, part of the garden a little bit, the snow viewing option, or isn't there a moon viewing option where you can pull down the top panel as well, right? Oh, they're all types. And, and there's, uh, it, it's really inventive. Uh, tateku is that general word that means doors and things that slide, fusuma and whatever. Uh, the engineering, uh, I mean, this is an incredible example. The tokonoma itself, the part to the right, opens into the garden. You know, um, there, there's so many ways in which Japan played with the tateku. Beautiful. Including in Meiji, by the way, when they got frosted glass, then they did the most beautiful designs on the frosted glass. And so the many, many ways that Japan has over the years developed these techniques. Now, you often do the calligraphy, I've noticed, in some of your projects. Mm -hmm. uh, you have done some beautiful work, which I see here and there. Uh, in your remodeled houses. Are you practicing all the time or is this just something you pick up <laughs> well, now and then? Practicing is not the right word. I'm not as serious as I should be maybe. It's, I, it's play. It's my play and I've loved it again since I, was, since I was nine years old. I've done this and it's become a kind of tradition that for the opening of one of these houses, I might do a screen or a, what the one you just showed at Chiori where, where I wrote it on the, on the shoji doors or we'll have hanging scrolls with calligraphy. I love to have calligraphy around me and it's, one, it's a kind of a trademark of, of, of my houses. Somewhere you'll see a calligraphy and it might not always be mine. Sometimes I'll find old calligraphy uh, to put on the Fusuma doors or something. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, we have another comment. Uh, people are really enjoying this talk. Thanks so much, Alex. <laughs> um, what is the ballpark figure for renovating a folk house? Yes. You know? Well, folk house, I think they mean minka, uh, this old, okay. these old houses. They're, by the way, it's terminology. Uh, the, the word that, that I grew up with and was used until recently was just called minka. Mm -hmm. uh, but nowadays they call them kominka which means old minka, uh, but that's, I think, what they mean, by, what this person is, means by a folk house, kominka. And this summit that, that you and I are going to is, is, I think, called a kominka summit, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the minka summit, I think. Oh, is it minka? Well, so they're yeah. using the classic term, which I'm happy about. I like, I prefer minka. But, but anyway, minka or kominka, it's all the same thing. And here, there's an enormous range because it depends on what level of comfort you want to bring it to, whether you're able to do some of the carpentry yourself, whether you're working with a government agency, in which case you have to work through official contractors and bidding, you know, and all that kind of thing, public bidding, or whether you can just do it as, as a private venture. Uh, but we're talking about somewhere between, let's say, 5 million yen a friend of mine just did, just fixed up a lovely little one. It also depends on the size. A little, uh, it was actually a little machia in Kameoka. 
and he did most of it himself. He did his own plastering. Uh, he got cheap uh, guys to come in and fix the fusma and whatever, repaper them and so on. It probably, the whole thing has cost him about five million, I would say. Whereas our projects, which can be, you know, very fancy with all the, uh, all the trimmings, uh, because they were government funded. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, have, can run uh, up to say 20 million. Yeah. Right, yeah. per house or even more. And so it, it, it's, it's highly variable. And by the way, I think there's a bit of a turning point going on, which is what this summit is a little bit about in my uh, uh, belief, is that for several decades, the mainstream was government funded projects with uh, basically um, government grants. And most of my projects were done that way. Uh, with some exceptions. And now I think the weight is shifting more to private people that buy these houses and restore them on their own. And that's been very advantageous because what it means is there's now a whole new group of people who are carpenters who specialize in Kaminka and people that provide certain kinds of uh, toilets and stoves and windows and whatever, especially for Kaminka and Kozai. Uh, that word Kozai means uh, old wood, basically beams, these fantastic beams that were in the in the ceiling structure or sliding doors and whatever. There are people that uh, have big warehouses and have collected these. And so there's now an industry of providing kozai uh, for these restoration projects. And so there's this kind of new thing going on. And as a result, I think it's going to be a bit cheaper. There's more variety. There That's are more right vendors. Mm -hmm. It's getting, I think, a bit easier. I, I heard, talked to a woman in Nagano who has a Zen retreat and she just found some old beams that someone was storing that she was able to use to build yeah. a new facility. Um, you talk about that in your book, how you were seeing so many beautiful old houses in Kyoto being knocked down and it was just oh, gut wrenching. Yeah. And you tried to go and salvage some, but it seems more popular now for people to at least keep those big, beautiful beams for reuse, right? Yes, but that said, 90% is just all thrown away. That's yeah. the reality. And so the people that do value these things and collect them and store them are, you know, should be given awards from the government or something. They're national treasures, and it, it's wonderful that they do it, but, it, but they're pretty rare. Uh, but they do exist. There's a wonderful uh, guy up in uh, uh, Fukushima. Uh, there, there's uh, a wonderful, uh, a huge warehouse of these things in Kagawa. Uh, you know, they, ex they exist, uh, but, but there should be more. Yeah. Uh, we have some... I, would, I would love to collect more if I, if I could just find uh, the funds to just move it. <laughs> Remember, yeah. Some of these things are truly massive, so you yeah. need enormous trucks and cranes and so on, and then you need an abandoned school or something to, to keep it all to in. To store it in, right? Yeah but, once, yeah, but once you've got it, these things can never come again. They're hand-hewn. These are like sculptures. Yeah. And the, uh, John Stolenmeyer, who's also going to be at the Minka Summit, uh, mm -hmm. when I was talking to him, he was talking about how mm -hmm. the old beams have the shape of the trees, which is so yes. rare to find now, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's because uh, basically, again, it's, we're back to myth making. This idea that Suki is Japan is another myth. And I've actually never seen a house in all my years that was built with sugi, ever. Never happened. What did they use? They used matsu and suga, which are two different, uh, basically, um, uh, pines. Suga is a kind of cedar, but it's related to, the, to pines. And they don't grow straight, right? You know, think of pine trees, bend a bit. And so what you find in those rafters are these wonderful sort of almost like giant billows of waves flowing over your head and they very ingeniously fit them together. Yeah, it's so beautiful to watch the, the traditional joinery without oh. nails, right? How everything is just fitted so beautifully, gorgeous. 
it's gorgeous and it's also um, extremely stable um, from a technical point of view. Yeah. These are these are houses that will stand forever. When we bought our old house and uh, mm -hmm. had some remodelers in and they said, you were lucky this is 60 years old and it's not 30 years old because it was built properly. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, that's key. And so uh, basically the modern houses are, are, are pretty flimsy. Uh, yeah. The older houses will stand until someone tears them down or they yeah. get abandoned. The worst thing that can happen is if they're abandoned and not used very shortly, it doesn't take long, the rot will set in. If I go away from Kamioka for a week and nobody's there, when I come back, I can smell the mildew. It's that fast. And so there's always, so there is always somebody there. I've had these young interns living in the house. If someone just lives there, the house will go on forever. And that's actually the big challenge uh, because one of Japan's modern problems is abandoned houses. It's a huge social issue. And there are 10 million of them. <laughs> Within the next 10 years or so, it'll rise to 20 million. That's no, just that's crazy. Shocking. Yeah. Uh, now, only a fraction of them are beautiful places worth saving. But even so, uh, it would be really a pity if what I think of is as the heritage of Japan is lost. And so we're kind of at an urgent moment when a lot, a, a huge amount needs to be done to save what's left. Yeah. A great comment from Tina McCarthy, who is in Australia. She bought a beautiful place in Onomichi that we talked about in the series. She said, uh, first visited Japan in 1985, was obsessed in the early 90s, I read Lost Japan. I was completely hooked and wanted an old house in Japan. That didn't happen until 2019. Was there any one thing that made you feel that this was your destiny? I think I felt it from the day I first saw Ia, honestly. I knew this was my place. And when I came back the next year to K, it was at KO officially, but I never went there. Uh, I was spent the whole time in Ia. And then I met David Kidd, from whom I learned more about th these old houses, and then eventually found Chiori. And, fr and, and from there, it was a straight line to today. I don't think I ever looked back. Isn't that odd? I wasn't thinking about it. I don't think I said to myself, this is destiny but that's how I felt. It just felt right to you. It felt right from the day I first saw those mists in uh, rising over the hills in Ia. Beautiful. Uh, another great question from Black Tengu on YouTube. Would you recommend purchasing a kominka for someone who would be in Japan for six months in the year and just using it as a holiday home? That's an interesting idea. Uh, well, this is key, actually, to the future of, of Kominka development, because the fact is most people are not going to live in those Kominka. And holiday homes, six months of the year is ambitious. You'll be lucky if you spend a week there. That's the way holiday homes are. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? No. Do it because you will. That week will be your best week of the year, A. But B, what we can then do, and we have done with a number of our developments, is we then manage it for you. So the house is kept clean, it's aired up. It, having people stay is the equivalent of having the interns, you know, living in my house in Kamioka. It means that people are there, it's uh, not only ventilated, but heated and cooled, and the grass is cut and et cetera, cl you know, cleaned. And so the house is kept in good condition and you can make a little money from it. Not much. So it's not going to be a big money earner, but it won't. It'll it'll help to pay some of the expenses, and that means that when you do go there, for you, if if it's a little as a week, that's okay. If it's six months, that's even better. Then the house is cared for. So that's I would to me that's part of the package of restoring these houses. It's not that you restore it and you hand it over and goodbye. You restore it and you take responsibility for operating it afterwards, which we've done with all of our projects. 
Yeah. And if you can uh, find local people to help take care of it, or you can rent it out on Airbnb when you're not there. And that helps keep a lively at, at atmosphere in the community too, not Absolutely. not a ghost town, just people using exactly. as best so, right? Exactly. Um, Airbnb is a little problematic, partly because they changed the law in Japan and you can only open it a certain number of months of the year. But the other problem is if you're not there, somebody's got to handle the Airbnb on site, clean the house, show the guests in, deal with the emails and whatever. So Airbnb does all by itself. Airbnb, you can do it, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. Uh, yeah. But but if you do have somebody on site, then you can do it. And, and uh, it's one of the ways to do it. Yeah, well, that is our hour. That went too fast, Alex. <laughs> 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 We're going to have to have you on again. We've only I just talked to. about Chiyori. You I have so to. many other projects around Japan I was planning on talking about. Uh, please join again and let's talk about some of the other projects too. Invite me on and I would love to talk anytime. That would be great. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you so much, Alex. Everybody Thank have you. a great day and uh, sign up to come and meet both of us at uh, April in the Minka Summit, April 22nd to 24th. It's going to be great. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Have a great bye -bye. day. Bye. bye.